thing I want to do is file my edges where I cut them with the shears. When you cut with shears, you're always going to have a slightly raggy um, effect on a very slight bevel, so I need to file that away. Now, when we did the intro to the tools, we said there's two main types of files. You get your full-size ones and your needle files. People quite often think that needle files are a good choice because you're working with a small bit of metal, but because it's a smaller surface area, it's easier to slip when you're doing your filing and also easier to stick your finger quite often. So it's always going to be quicker and safer using a full size file and we use the little needle files if we need to get into any little nooks and crannies later on. So when you're looking at your full size files there's a couple of things to take into consideration. The first thing is they do come in different sizes so not only do you get the tiny needle files you also get much larger files and even bigger than this one. So for example this is far too coarse and it's just far too long for working with small pieces whereas these ones are pretty perfect. So these are six inch files and the measurement goes from the heel of the file here to the end, so that's six inches. And the clasp is smooth, so if you have a close look at this, I can run my finger up and down it, it's nice and smooth, not all gnarly and coarse like that big file a minute ago. The other thing is you get flat files and half round ones. So a half round file where it's round on one side and flat on the other is going to be um, a lot more useful if you only have one file compared to just having a flat file, but it's really important you don't try and file flat things with a round surface. Now, depending on whether your files are American pattern or Swiss pattern, if you want a smooth file, they'll sometimes be cold smooth, and that one's in too tight so you can't quite see it, um, or if they're Swiss, they'll have a number attributed to them. So this is a number four, and it's down here, I'm sure you can't see it, but that's where you're looking to locate the numbers, and a four means that it's a nice smooth file. Another important thing with files is health and safety. So quite often when you buy them, they don't come with a file handle. You sometimes have to buy these separately. Now this tang, this little pointy bit on the end, um, although in theory it's blunt, in reality it is quite sharp. And when you're doing your filing, quite often that tang is lined up with your wrist. So there is the opportunity to seriously, seriously hurt yourself. Um, so it's very, very important that there's always something over that tang while you're using your files. Now, if you don't have a handle yet and you want to use your file, there's other ways you could pad it out. So for example, if you've got an old cork um, or just layers and layers and layers of masking tape, some bubble wrap, something to keep you going, but ideally, each file needs to have its own handle and they need hammering down to keep them nice and secure on there. When you're ready to do your filing, you're going to file with the line that you're trying to smooth off. So quite often when students are filing, when they're starting off, they're doing this sort of motion or that sort of motion because it feels really quick and productive. But the problem with that is you're just going to file little flat pads, little nibbly bits all along something that you're trying to file lovely and smooth. So you need to go with the line that you're trying to file, not against it. I'm also going to have a lot more support if I actually sit down. So the other thing to take into consideration is the files only cut on the forward motion and most people like to do this. <laughs> If you're going rocking back and forth like that, one thing is every time you push away, you're removing metal particles, and every time you pull back, you're potentially dragging them back into the metal and leaving with a raggy finish. Um, the other thing is you're going to end up trashing your files. And lastly, you just don't have the control. So if I'm doing this, I can't really see what I'm doing. My arm's moving all over the place. I don't have a huge amount of control. If I sit... <coughs> push and lift, push and lift, push and lift while following the curve of my metal, I have full control and I can see when I'm filing down to my guideline. Now you can just file up in the air, but it's going to be a million times easier if you can support your elbows on a table and do it with the curve, with the line of the metal. And it's going to be even better if you have a bench peg and you can file away a little notch and then you can pop your metal in there so it's lovely and secure and then you're able to fly with the curve. Can you see I'm doing this sort of rotating motion with my hand because I'm letting the file follow the curve of the metal. 
because if I filed flat, I'm just going to file flat pads into it. The other thing is, although I'm filing with the metal, I like to do it on a very slight angle because that way you've got more surface area, so you're less likely to miss and drop off the side of your piece. And also, if you're holding and filing on a slight angle, this handle is sticking out away from your wrist, whereas if you're filing completely flat and straight, quite often the handle is then digging into your wrist, which I find a bit uncomfortable. So now I've filed my piece, I'm ready to take the plastic backing off and the tape that I popped on there. The masking tape should come off nice and cleanly, fingers crossed. Left a little bit of residue. But we have a nice evenly filed piece. Now, quite often when you file your metal, you end up with little rough burrs where the metal that you've removed is sort of rolled round onto the edges. We want to get rid of those little burrs. Um, and one of the ways you can do that is with either a buff stick, a nail file from the pound shop, or some wet and dry sandpaper. I quite like using the little nail files. I'm just going to drag it away, drag those little burrs away. Normally the masking tape doesn't leave any residue, but because I've been holding it for so long while sorting out this demo, I'd warmed it up, which is why there's a little bit of sticky residue left. So nail polish remover should take that straight off. I'm just going to put a little bit on some cotton and give it a wrap. There you go, that's coming straight off. So once I've done this, I'll just give it a quick dip in some water and then we're good to go. Once you've smoothed off the edges of your metal, you want to tackle the surface a little bit. Quite often when you buy metal, you end up with little hairline scratches all over it. And certainly when you've been knocking it around um, in the studio, it picks up scratches. Depending on how scratched the surface is, depends on how much sanding you're going to need to do. When we do sanding, we use um, wet and dry paper or emery paper. So it's the same as sandpaper, quite often I refer to it as sandpaper, but the difference is it has a much stronger backing and it comes in much more grades of coarseness compared to normal orange DIY sandpaper. Now, the way they list the different grades are by number. The lower the number, the coarser the paper. The higher the number, the smoother the paper. But I always tell my students not to get hung up on the numbers. It's good when you're ordering it if you need to make sure that you're getting a nice sort of medium to smooth sandpaper rather than something really coarse. But beyond that, I always think you should look and you should feel. The reason being, as soon as you start to use your, your wet and dry paper or sandpaper, it starts to wear away slightly. So although this was a piece of 600, Actually, as soon as I started using it, it's so much smoother. It feels much more like the 1000 or 1200 would do. So therefore, it's much better to actually look at what you're using and give it a feel and then make a decision on if it's whether or not it's the right coarseness for your job that you want to do. Because we're going to hammer texture them in a minute, a lot of people wouldn't bother sanding at this point, but I always think it's good practice to keep sanding as you go, because further down the line, if you impart a really lovely intricate texture on here and your metal had scratch marks in it, you will have no way of removing those marks at the end of the process without also removing your texture. So, in general, keep sanding. The more sanding, the better. When you sand your metal, most people would sand all over like this, which is what I tend to do. I tend to just go for it. But good practice would state that instead of going all over, you sand in one direction. And if you sand in one direction, you're going to be able to see whether or not there's any scratch marks or lines going in another direction. If there are still lines going in a different direction, then you either need to keep sanding, put a bit more elbow grease into it, or you might need to consider going up to a slightly coarser grit to be able to remove those initial scratches. Then when you're ready to work down to a smoother sandpaper, I would rotate this and sand in the other direction. And the same, you will then be able to tell 
if there's still lines going in the first direction that you sanded and therefore you need to keep persevering. Now I've got two nice smooth bits of metal and I'm going to texture them with my hammer in a second. Now one of the things that we discussed was that although you can texture your metal directly onto your workbench or your table, as long as you're not worried about damaging it, not your good <laughs> dining room table, um, it's never going to give a particularly um, in-depth indentation. It's not going to show up particularly well, which is why we use a steel block, a nice hard surface to do our hammering onto. And as we discussed earlier, I really like the steel um, bench peg and steel anvil combinations that you can get because these clip directly onto your table and you've got your surface for hammering on and your peg that is going to become invaluable later on down the line. But if you're worried about noise, you can get them with rubber bases, standalone, or if you found an offcut of steel that you're going to use, you could get a great big catalogue Put that on top and do your hammering on there. Do your hammering. What's going to happen is your hammer or your punch or whatever you're using to make your indentations and texture with is going to push down into the metal and that's going to leave some sort of indent or mark behind. Now the thicker the metal in general the more the metal can be pushed down and the more pronounced the indent and texture will be. Like we said we're working with 0.5 mil so it is fairly thin so you're not going to maybe get as uh, a defined texture as using 1 mil sheet say um, but it's thick enough to get a nice texture and it will do and as I say it's a lot cheaper it's a lot easier to work with when you're first learning. We'll discuss the two main types of metal hammer that you can get. You can buy cross pane hammers these are the ones with the wedge shape and a flat head to them and you can get the ball pane ones the ones with the bald or curved um, end to them and again a flat surface cross pane and ball pane hammers come in all different shapes and sizes you can get ones from the pound shop and you can get vintage ones and you can get jewelry specific ones now the jewelry specific hammers are absolutely beautiful a lot of the time they have completely smooth surfaces so that when you're hammering your work they won't leave marks behind but because of that you really do have to look after them and they cost a lot of money especially when you're starting out i like to use cheap hammers or like i say really gnarly vintage hammers because we're using them for texturing to impart texture and you can get some really beautiful textures the more gnarly and textured the hammer is the cross pane hammer the wedge shaped one will leave wedge shaped marks linear marks And the ball pane hammer will leave little indents. Like so, which is a very traditional hammer texture, very popular. Now, if you hit straight down, your overall shape isn't going to particularly change. If you hit on the edge, your edge will become a little bit wibbly wobbly. And if you hit in a direction, your metal will start to move in that direction that you're hitting it. It will start to splay. So there's no right or wrong, but if you want to keep your overall shape, you're going to want to hammer straight down and not directly hit the edge. If you want a more organic feel, then that's when you start hitting the edge or maybe flicking the hammer in a direction. I tend to just go for it. I just like hammering and, you know, I always refer to myself as a bish bash bosh maker. I just jump in and have a go and do everything by eye but I know a lot of people like to be more precise than that so if you do want to have very even hammering what you can do is take a sharpie and draw a guideline so I've just halved my metal if this was a square a more even shape then I could get a set square and measure it out properly and draw quadrants onto it so I've got guides and then that way I can hammer one side and then I've got a guide to hammer the other side so that I can tell that I've hammered each section of the metal nice and equally. Now if you suffer from RSI or you're going to be doing a lot of hammering you need to make sure you're hammering in a safe way. Most people grip hold of the hammer for dear life and they're really going to town with the whacking. If I'm gripping this hammer then I can feel tension all the way up my arm all the way up to my elbow whereas if I hold it lightly and let the hammer bounce 
I've got no tension and it's not putting any strain on my arm. So in theory, what you're aiming for, I'll move this over so you can see a bit better, is to be able to bounce the hammer more or less at the same point and you can move your work and then that way you're getting nice even blows and you're not putting any strain on your arm. When you're hammering, if you don't want to hold on to it, because obviously if you slip and hammer your finger, if you do that hard, there is always a chance that you could break your finger. And at the very least, it's going to hurt, so you don't want to do that. So if in doubt, you can support your work with a bit of masking tape. Because um, you're able to hammer through that, you'll still get nice indentations, but it's very easy to remove when you're finished. Like so.